So here's the joke. Uh, and actually, before I start the joke, I've got to show you some mathematics, because it's a mathematical joke. So it's a very famous piece of mathematics, so famous it appears on, used to appear on German banknotes. Uh, and it's a piece of mathematics that, I don't know if you've met or not, it's the bell-shaped curve. It's called the bell-shaped curve, sometimes called a normal distribution, sometimes called a Gaussian, named in honor of this gentleman, Carl Friedrich Gauss, who was a very, 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 very great mathematician who did a lot of work associated with this curve. So the bell-shaped curve is something that appears almost everywhere in mathematics and its applications. It's completely ubiquitous. Um, so it appears in, if I were to do a histogram, the sort of thing you do at junior school, histogram of people's heights in the room here. Uh, so we find out how, count how many people have heights between five foot and five foot one, how many people have heights between five foot one and five foot two, and we do a histogram. You end up with a curve that looks roughly like this, and if you do it for lots and lots and lots of people, the curve you get looks closer and closer to this, this distribution. It's not just heights, it could be lengths of fingers, lengths of noses, it's not just to do with people, anything to do with sort of animals, distributions of lengths of bits of your body, that kind of thing. Uh, you often find a bell-shaped curve. Now, I'm not a biologist, and I sense I'm entering, entering dangerous territory. So I'll say it has, has applications in many other areas. E economics, uh, many fluctuation properties of the stock market are described by, by this curve. Um, it has applications uh, in physics, that if you look at the surface of the sea far from, far from the coast, um, the surface of the sea fluctuates because there are lots of waves sloshing around, and the distribution of heights of the sea follows a curve roughly like that. Um, it has applications to lasers, the laser I'm holding here. The sort of light you can see looks pretty constantly bright, but it's not actually, it's fluctuating a little bit, and the fluctuations follow a curve like that. If you look at the motion of molecules in the air uh, around our heads, follow their distribution of velocities, you end up with a curve that's like this. So almost everywhere in mathematics and its applications, you find this curve. Now, this curve has a simple equation describing it, and the equation you can sort of see there. Um, and uh, that's a remarkable thing, because this curve appears almost everywhere in mathematics and its applications, economics, biology, physics. Um, and the remarkable thing is that this has a very simple equation. So what that means is that this simple equation kind of appears everywhere. So this simple equation sort of underpins many, many areas of mathematics and its applications. OK, well, that's the preamble. Uh, here's, the, here's the joke, or rather the, the sort of moderately amusing story. So here it is. So there, there are two people who, who were at school together. Um, and um, there's a school reunion many, many years later. And they've not seen, them, not seen each other since they left school. And so one of them says to the other, so what did you end up doing with your life? The other one says, well, I became a mathematician. Ha! Huh. So what kind of mathematics did you do? Well, I studied the bell-shaped curve. Why would you study that curve? Well, it underpins many areas of applications of mathematics. Economics, biology, physics, almost anything you'll find this curve. Well, I find that kind of hard to believe that one curve appears sort of everywhere in the world, in economics and biology and physics. That seems kind of hard to believe. Are you pulling my leg? Nope. That's really what I study, and that curve is really appears everywhere. Ha. Huh. Well, such a powerful curve, that must have a really complicated equation describing it. No? That's the equation. It's extremely simple. This seems unlikely to me. I kind of don't believe it could be so simple. Are you sure? Absolutely sure. So what is this equation then? Let's have a look at it in more detail. What are the symbols that appear there? I'm not sure if you can see those symbols, so let me do a close-up. What are the symbols that appear in this amazing equation? Well, there's mu, that's the mean, that's the average, average height, let's say. There's sigma, that's the variance, that's the kind of width of the distribution. And they're the only parameters that appear in this curve. That's all you need to know about this curve. Hold on. There's one more symbol. What's that symbol there? Ah, that's pi. And what's pi? It's the circumference of a circle divided by the diameter of a circle. Which circle? 
any circle you can draw on flat paper. OK, now I know you're fooling me. What's people, what have people's heights got to do with a circle? What's the economy got to do with a circle? What's the surface of the sea got to do with a circle? OK, that was the joke. Um, <laughs> so I, I did warn you, it's not, it's not hilarious. Um, but it is kind of remarkable. And the more you think about it, the more remarkable it seems. What has the distribution of people's heights got to do with the geometry of a circle? What has the length of our arms got to do with that geometry? What has the fluctuations in the economy got to do with geometry of a circle? Well, the answer is I don't know, and I don't have a simple explanation. You do kind of learn an explanation when you do mathematics at university, but it's not the kind of explanation you can sort of say in words. So this is what Wigner wanted. This is the story Wigner used to illustrate his essay. And he drew several conclusions from this. The first is that mathematical concepts turn up in entirely unexpected uh, concepts, you know, in entirely unexpected contexts. Pi shows up in the distribution of heights of people in a room or in fluctuations in laser light. And that's kind of remarkable. Second thing is that often these mathematical concepts permit an unexpectedly close and accurate description of scientific phenomena. The bell-shaped curve really is an amazingly accurate description of what goes on. And pi appears there. So mathematics is kind of intertwined with our description of the world. And that description seems phenomenally accurate. So what Wigner concluded from this, and most of the essay is a development of this conclusion, is, and I, I quote, because I think it's a very beautiful quotation, the enormous usefulness of mathematics in the natural sciences is something bordering on the mysterious. There's no rational explanation for it. How is it that something we, as human beings, come up with, thinking about dividing the circumference of a circle by its diameter, how come that concept shows up all around us in the world and seems to be essential to the explanation of the real world? Well, that's what I'm going to be talking about. This is Wigner's big idea, his big question. And I'm going to be giving you lots of examples um, of how this, shows, of how this uh, turns out. Uh, but Wigner had another conclusion, which I think is even more stunning. And I won't tell you what that is yet. Uh, I'll get to that at the end. But it's that this uncanny usefulness should actually worry us. So you might think this is a great thing that mathematics is so much involved with the real world and so successful in describing it. But Wigner had the counter point of view, he said, actually, this should concern us. And I'll tell you why a bit later. OK. Well, Wigner's essay starts by telling you what mathematics is. And this is uh, kind of interesting, because we've had lots of discussions here about mathematics all through the day. And obviously, the question is, what is this damn thing? What is this subject? Well, here's Wigner's stab at telling you what mathematics is. He says, it's the science of skillful operations with concepts and rules invented just for this purpose. So in Wigner's point of view, mathematics is just a game. It's a sequence of games. And all mathematicians are are people who come up with new games to play. They invent the rules, and then they play the game. And that's pure mathematics. That's a pretty accurate definition of what pure mathematics is, I would say. Um, it's people coming up with games, games to play, rules that they invent, and just enjoying playing with them, and just seeing where they go. So what distinguishes good mathematics from bad mathematics? Well, you might say it's the, it's the connectedness with the real world. And some of the concepts of elementary mathematics were certainly motivated by questions in the real world. For example, the sort of stuff you learn up to GCSE level involving angles. Well, they're clearly involved with measuring the real world. Uh, lengths of lines, they're clearly important if you want to measure the real world. Uh, numbers, they're important if you want to count things. So lots of elementary ideas in mathematics are very clearly associated and motivated by attempts to describe the real world. But Wigner's point was that actually, as soon as you get beyond GCSE, as soon as you go to study lots of pure mathematics, in particular when you go to university, you find many concepts in mathematics that are not at all motivated by the real world. They're invented just to make beautiful games. They're invented by people not motivated by attempts to describe the real world. They're invented by people just to have fun. And they, when they're invented, they seem to have no connection with the real world at all. So I'm going to give you some examples of this right now. Two examples. 